Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, March 14th. Today's topic is our featured teacher, Avra Robinson. And your show hosts are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffitt, and Tammy Moore. Thanks to Tammy for doing the closed captioning. And I will turn the mic over to Peggy to introduce Avra. Well, good morning, everyone. I apologize for my voice today, but I seem to have caught a spring cold along with some allergies. So it's not my microphone. It truly is my voice. So I apologize. But I love how our PLNs help us to meet new people and learn great ideas and resources resources that support our learning. And we are so happy to have all of you as part of our PLN. I met our featured teacher, Ava Robinson, on a Google Plus group called Instructional Technology Integrators and Coaches when she shared a fantastic tack that she had created about PicMonkey. Well, I love PicMonkey, so I couldn't wait to see what she had to share. Tack was completely new to me, so of course I had to go exploring on her site. I was so impressed with the amazing talent she had for creating easy to understand, motivating tutorials that she created using TAC. I loved <clears throat> how she was constantly reaching out to her PLN, sharing what she was working on, and seeking feedback and suggestions from people, always with a positive, eager to learn attitude. Over the past few months, a number of people on our surveys kept suggesting that they wanted to learn more about TAC. So when I discovered Avra, I knew we had the perfect person to invite to share with us. But she does so much more with tech integration than just TAC. So it was obvious that she needed to be a featured teacher so she could share it all. She is a Google Education trainer who is dedicated to helping teachers and students make their lives and learning more effective and more fun using technology. You will see that she is passionate about helping teachers find their success language. That's a great word for success with technology. And she really believes that with enough self-confidence, everyone can be successful. She was a classroom teacher in both third grade and kindergarten. And although she speaks techie, Avra translates this tech talk into just plain English, helping all of us. She is a huge proponent of digital publishing for students and teachers. And today, she's going to share a wide variety of tools that she uses to help students and teachers create digital portfolios. So I'm so excited to introduce you to Avra, our March feature teacher. And what I've learned from Avra is that although there are many amazing tech tools for teachers and students to use, it's what you do with them that makes them magic. So I'm going to move us on, ask Avra our newbie question, and let her take over from here. So we'd love to hear from you exactly what does Web 2.0 mean to you, and why do you use Web 2.0 tools in your classroom. All right. Well, good morning. Thank you so much, Peggy, for that wonderful introduction. I really appreciate your kind words. I have just been blown away by all of the kindness that you've shown me in the last month or so. Um, you've been quite the ego boost. My family says that if you don't stop saying such nice things, they're going to have to widen the doorways for my head. <laughs> so I really appreciate it. Um, when I thought about the newbie question, I thought it was a perfect way to just kind of talk about my experiences with technology. Um, so just, you've already said so much, but just a little bit about me. Um, I am, well, I, I am Avra. I am a mom of two awesome kids. I have a 14-year-old daughter and a 4-year-old son. So I had them 10 years apart. Not sure if that was my wisest choice, but <laughs> um, they keep me busy. I am an instructional technology coach to pretty much everyone in my life. So um, I've spent years just helping everybody 
try to use technology in their lives and I've always wanted to just try to find ways to make it easier for them so that they could find um, joy and success in whatever they're doing, whether it's my parents trying to program their DVR or whether it was my teachers in their classrooms trying to find ways to utilize technology with their students to be successful. So um, it's kind of my, my life's ambition and goal to just try to help people like it as much as I do. Um, so back in the year 2000, when I was six months pregnant with my daughter, I had just come back to the area where I live. I live um, in an area near Chicago, so about an about hour outside of Chicago or so, um, near Northern Illinois University. And um, I was looking for a, a classroom job. I had been a a classroom teacher in the past, but I was kind of half-hearted in my search. I wasn't entirely sure that I wanted to take on a classroom position. Um, being six months pregnant, knowing that I was going to have a maternity leave, I kind of felt that um, in a new school with new students and new parents, I wasn't sure if I wanted to, to leave in the middle of the school year. So I had a superintendent call me the day before his school year began, um, my beloved superintendent of 14 years, and he said to me, Avra, are you, are you looking for a job? Would you like to come do the media tech position for us? And I said, well, George, what is that? And he said, well, tell you what, why don't you come in and spend Institute Day with us? It's our first teacher in service of the year. We'll tell you about it. You can meet the staff. You can see our school. If you don't like it, if it's not for you, I'll pay you for the day, and we'll go our separate ways. Um, well, so 14, 15 years later, I spent 14 years there and started out um, with 20 Windows desktops. So you can see in the picture here that wonderful beige-ish gray color that all of the computers were back in the day. Boy, they were cutting edge at the time um, with Windows 98 installed on them. But um, throughout the years, we just we bought more and we bought different ones and we explored all different devices. And then finally in 2013, um, my last year there was 2013, 2014. 2013, we went one to one. Um, again, that wonderful superintendent and my awesome faculty, um, we all kind of worked together. It was a kind of a hybrid system. We put Chromebooks in place, we had some iPads, and then we had a whole bunch of Windows computers that I had just been reformatting and reformatting and kind of kept them running. And the biggest thing is, is that there were only 125 kids in the district. So my journey into the world of Web 2.0 began in this wonderful, tiny little town of 500 people. Um, in an even tinier school, 15 teachers, 125 students. So that's why we were actually able to go one-to-one, -one, even though we were so little and didn't necessarily have any money. Um, they just had me who kept trying to reformat these computers and keep them going. And I kept saying to my superintendent, you know, we have so many machines. I, I need more time. I don't have enough time. And finally, he came to me and said, if we have that many, let's make it happen. Let's go one-to-one. -one. So. We did. Um, so you can see kind of on the map here where I'm at. And um, I will say it was, it was a K through 8 building, um, so one classroom per grade level. So that gives you an idea. It was the smallest school I'd ever been in. I grew up in Elgin, which um, is closer to Chicago. And you know I graduated in a class of 450 people in my graduating class from high school. So this was a completely different world for me. But boy, I'll tell you what happened. I got into this school. And I was amazed at the amazing, incredible, wonderful things that all of these teachers were doing in their classrooms. Um, you'll notice most of my pictures feature my daughter, and that's because I have permission to share her pictures. So any pictures I do share of students or any student work that I share, just so you know, I absolutely have permission from parents to do that. Um, but if you get tired of seeing pictures of Allie, I apologize. Um, it's just that I can share her pictures because I'm her mama. So for example, our sixth grade teacher every year had the kids making these gingerbread houses. And they were raising money. They would sell them at basketball games, raise money for the Adopt-A-Family program during the holidays when they would adopt a family. Um, here you can see pictures of Allie at our academic fair. We had an academic fair every year. It was called Academic Avenues. Um, they had spelling bees. They had 100th day projects. Donuts for Dads, our awesome third grade teacher, came and shared the idea for Donuts for Dads, where we would have all the dads come in and have donuts before school and share with them what was happening in the classrooms and just have a really neat time for um, the dads and the, and the kids to be able to spend a little time having breakfast together. So just really, really neat things happening all throughout the school, um, plays, puppet shows. And having been a teacher, I was just so 
enamored by and in awe of these teachers because I knew how much time it took to plan these activities and to come up with ways for students to be successful and to celebrate learning. And I just I really at that point thought that I was going to go back into the classroom, so I kind of tried to go in and soak up everything they were doing, because um, I was thinking that I was, I was going to go back and become a classroom teacher, <laughs> which never happened. But um, I was just always just so thrilled to see the neat things that were taking place in the classrooms and outside of the classrooms and school-wide. So that kind of began my journey to Web 2.0, and I'll tell you why. I decided that I wanted to create a scrapbook, and of course I wanted to do it online because I had this tech bug in me. And so my amazing colleague Maria, um, she was technically my aide, but truly just my colleague in the computer lab, which was also the library, she and I decided that we wanted to create a scrapbook. We wanted an online scrapbook where we could take pictures of the kids, because we had already started doing that. We were always taking pictures of the neat things happening in the classrooms. And so we wanted to be able to just share some of these incredible things and some of this fun and the joy and everything that was happening with the outside world. So we took <laughs> our digital camera at the time. So you know, this is early 2000s, like maybe 2003, 2004. Literally, this was like a picture of our, ca of our camera. So the old floppy disk fit inside it. And we took pictures. And then we used a print shop program to create pages for this scrapbook. And what was neat about print shop is that it would allow us to export um, our print shop files as JPEGs, so as photos, and then we were able to put them onto our website. I had begged my superintendent to let me create a website. At first, he was very hesitant um, just because he knew that there would be certain um, things that we had to have on there, and he wasn't sure what all the rules were. So until he had done the research and we made sure that it was OK, we didn't have a website right away. In fact, when I started in 2000, we didn't even have internet access in the building yet. They were still wiring that, and that came later that fall. So um, this is kind of what our scrapbook ended up looking like. And what it was was just all of these pages that we created, Maria and I, my, my colleague and I created, um, having taken pictures of the things that were happening in the school. And then what you did, or what what our viewers did is they could click on the picture and it would get bigger. So what that meant for us on a tech end um, was that we had this large image file that then we had to resize and make small enough so it could be like a thumbnail image of sorts. And then I would have to try to fit them onto this HTML page. And I was using Dreamweaver. Um, I didn't have any training in it whatsoever. Remember, I'm a kindergarten teacher turned techie. So I was just kind of making stuff up as I went along. But it worked. So what we ended up with then were these pages that kind of looked like this. And so kids you know, involved in these incredible learning experiences, and we really just wanted to showcase them. So then periodically we would have something like this. It just became a really fun chronicle, a, just a neat way to chronicle our years. We would absolutely go back and look to see what had happened if we weren't sure, did we have Donuts for Dads in October or November that year? We could go back into the scrapbook and look. And it was just a really neat way to just share what was going on in our school. So what ended up happening for me then was that I got all this positive feedback. And I was able to see that my gut was right, that sharing this stuff online was so important. It was a neat thing. I'll never forget the day that I got the email from a grandma who lived far away from her granddaughter. <laughs> and I just, I, I got tears in my eyes that day, just like I am now. She was so excited that we had created this scrapbook because she got to see what was going on in her granddaughter's life. Same thing with working moms. And then our teachers were thrilled too. Thank you for taking the time to showcase what I'm doing in my classroom. And the kids were thrilled. They couldn't wait to go home and, and show the parents the stuff that was happening to them. You know, I made my AR goal. They took a picture of me. It's going to be on the website. So it just kind of proved to me that my gut was right and that we should be sharing. However, it was a lot of work. And Maria and I um, kind of bit off a little bit more than we could chew, which is kind of the story of my life. I, I tend to do that. Um, I want things to be really great. Peggy knows this from um, the week with me. I, I've been <laughs> 1 o'clock in the morning working on my slides for this and then emailing her and bugging her. And she's been wonderful helping me. But I always just want to do things, well, kind of to a perfectionist standard. So I needed to settle down and find a way for the kids to be more involved so that that way I would have more time. 
So we got the kids involved and we had them start to create pages. And that did help. That alleviated some of the workload um, and that alleviated some of um, everything that we needed to do. But the problem was that without the Web 2.0 tools in place that we have today, everything funneled through me still. So I was, you know, I was teaching tech classes. I should have said that at the beginning. I, K through 8, I had them all come to me twice a week to the computer lab and I taught them technology. And then I ran the network the rest of the time. So I was their only tech person in the district um, and in the district, so that meant in the building. So, you know, as we got more and more computers and more stuff happening in the classrooms with the computers, I was trying to fix things, trying to keep everyone's email running, oh my goodness, um, and, and just keep the network running and all of that. So then to try to keep this stuff current and post it up on the website and all of that, it all had to happen through my computer. Really small district, only had Dreamweaver for one computer. I had one FTP connection. And at that point, we definitely weren't allowing students to just be publishing to our website. That was unheard of at the time. It was like I had permission from my superintendent to have created this website, but nobody else had permission to, to do any publishing. It all had to funnel through me. So. As we continued on with the scrapbook, then it kind of became the idea of an online student newspaper for all the same reasons. We wanted to share the stuff that was happening in our schools. But really, for our, for our newspaper, we had a different set of objectives. We wanted it to stop being something that was shown through the eyes of the teachers. We wanted it to be shown, we wanted people to see our school through the eyes of our kids and what was important to them. Let them showcase what was happening. Let them be the ones to write articles and take pictures of the events around the school. So what we did is we created this, um, this newspaper and it replaced this newsletter that used to go out to our community that our teachers published um, articles to at least once a month. Sometimes it was quarterly, it depended on the year, um, but it was like 10 pages long. So as we looked at going green, um, we were able to put it online and then we did still print it out for people that didn't have internet access at the time. This was probably like 2008, 2009 or so when we started doing this. So we, we were looking at it as a way to be able to replace some things that were on paper, but also then get the kids more involved. So my very first newspaper staff, 2010, 2011, um, they all gave themselves silly names because we weren't using kids' names online yet at all. And you can see that we just had a really great time starting to put it together. Problem was, we did it the same way. We used the print shop images and then resized them. So again, it was just all going on my website and it was just really hard for me to keep up with. So it kind of just became daunting for me. So the bottom line was, I always knew what I wanted to be able to do. I just didn't have the tools like we do now with all of our Web 2.0 tools. I didn't have them um, to be able to use, and so it just was harder. I, I was doing the same kind of stuff that we can do today, but now kids can do it and teachers can do it so much more easily. Um, and so I really just wanted to find a way for the kids to be able to be more participatory for them to be able to publish so that it wasn't all funneling for me. And the biggest thing was that I really just wanted to share the joy of what was happening. I wanted people to see what was happening in our school. I wanted far away family, far away friends, or even just our community right there in that little town of 500 to have the chance to see all the stuff that's happening in classrooms. Having been a classroom teacher, I know, and having watched my amazing colleagues, I know how much time they spend. And they work so hard. And you know what? kids work so hard. It's their job full time. When my daughter didn't want to do her homework, I'd say to her, girl, this is your job right now. You're a student. And it, it is. I mean, it's a, it's a full time job. And they're working hard. And if we're sharing that out online with everybody, then people can see what's happening and they can start to have more respect for all of the great stuff that's happening in classrooms. I kind of have this byline of sorts and it's let's tell a new story about education. Education gets such a bad rap when there are so many teachers across the country, across the world who are doing amazing things with their kids and so many kids out there who are learning and growing and trying hard to learn even when it's really difficult for them, they're working hard and I just really think it's important that we share the positives because I believe that joy is contagious and that positivity is contagious. So. That's kind of my, <laughs> that's my whole sales job on why we should be publishing. Besides that, it also gives us the opportunity 
This is the front page, actually, of a TAC that I created called Read, Write, and Speak All About It. And the link is in the live binder. Um, it's all about students publishing online. And there's a million reasons. I mean, besides collaboration and communication, we also can get into some really rich, authentic discussions about digital citizenship and citizenship in general, what's appropriate to share, what's not appropriate to share. Um, having been a tech person through my daughter's growing up time, I've always been very open with her in terms of what she's allowed to do. And I let her have a Facebook account when she was little. I monitored it for a while. I didn't let her have her picture on there. Um, but I wanted to be part of that with her. And that was just a personal parenting choice that I made. But I also wanted to keep a tab on what was happening in the world with kids. And it made me realize that even our, our littlest ones have an Instagram account. They have Facebook. They have Twitter. Um, and what's happening with kids is that even when um, parents don't realize it, they're sharing. So if you've told them they can't have a Facebook account, they might have a different account on a different social network that we as parents or we as teachers don't even know about at first. Um, Allie told me in no uncertain terms a couple of years ago that Facebook, <laughs> no one's using Facebook anymore, Mom. The grown-ups took over Facebook. We're all on Instagram now. So you know they don't necessarily want to be in that same network that we are, but as parents and as teachers, it's important um, that we keep up with what they are sharing. And so by starting to share with them in the classroom, it gives us the opportunity to talk to them about what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. So beyond um, the appropriate versus inappropriate conversation, I'll go back to just one more time. It's about the pride and the joy. It's about the collaboration and cooperation that they go through. I've seen kids um, go from not really caring what an essay is like to all of a sudden, if they're going to publish it online, taking it to a friend without even the teacher asking them to and saying, hey, can you help me look at this? Because if we're going to put this up, that boy that I met at the basketball game from the other school might see it, and I don't want to look like a dork. So literally, have heard those words out of kids' mouths. And so all of a sudden, when we're sharing online, we have an authentic audience. Kids are sharing for a purpose, and they know that someone besides their parents and their teacher are going to see what they do. And so it becomes that answer of, do I want it to be good enough? Do I want it to be good enough for the B that my mom says I have to get in English this quarter? Or do I want it to truly be good? Because it's going to be out there, and people might see it, and my name is attached to it. So it kind of takes it to a new level. So what happened was, I met Google. And Google, honestly, I think was one of my very first Web 2.0 tools. What had happened, and it's amazing how things happen for a reason. A really bad thing happened um, that led to a great thing. And that was that our web hosting company that we've been hosting our website through all of a sudden wanted to charge for email accounts. And we didn't have them for the kids. We only had them for the teachers. But still, they wanted a couple dollars a month per user. Um, and my superintendent and I said, no way, you know, email's free. We're not going to pay this. So I started looking, and I thought, you know, email's free all over the web. There's got to be something. Well, what I didn't realize, I had signed us up for this thing called a Google Education account several years previous. I really just wanted to use the shared calendar function in Google. And at that point, my faculty said, are you kidding me? We have a calendar that hangs right here in the lounge. Avra, why do we need to sign in with a username and a password for a calendar? So they didn't really want to use it when I signed us up. But it worked out beautifully, because a couple of years later, I, all, I realized that we had this Google Apps for Education account. And by then, it had exploded into this whole suite of programs. And so one of the very first things I did with Google was I used Google Sites. And that achieved that newspaper that I had wanted. So all of a sudden then, kids could be publishing without having to funnel through me or through Maria. And so we saw so much explode in just a couple of months as we transitioned over to this new format. Um, all of a sudden, we had kids collaborating and communicating with each other. And they were becoming so creative. It was just a new fun way of doing things, too, which is always fun for kids. But for us, it was freedom without worry, because we could create page level permissions so they could only publish to certain pages. We also had the revision history in Google Sites, which is like the revision history in Google Docs, if you're familiar with it. Um, it was an opportunity for us to be able to go in and see who had done what. And if somebody did make a mistake, we could say, oh, hey, look, you did this here, and you, know, you need to look at doing it differently next time. Or we could reset things if they did get screwed up. It was just a wonderful way to be able to get them publishing online. So what we ended up with was this. This is um, a screen capture of our 
website, um, our Google site that became our newspaper. And it was called A Colt's Tale. Um, our, our mascot was the Creston Colt. So um, they basically they had, we had a page for each month. And what the kids would do is they would write articles. And then they would put pictures in. And so the way it worked was that the eighth grade ELA teacher would, and I would assign articles to the kids, and they would start with a shared Google Doc, and they would write their article. She had them um, peer edit, so they had to share it with three other friends and go back and forth. She absolutely took um, grades on their editing abilities back and forth with each other. She would look at their comments they were giving each other, so that way she knew that they were doing a good job with that. They'd go back and forth with their peers, and then they would turn it into her, and then go back and forth with her. So. She then would make sure it got to 100% or make, making sure that it was all appropriate and ready to go to be published online. And at the same time then, the kids would take our digital camera and or they, sometimes they took their devices, their phones and stuff, and they'd go out and take video and um, pictures of things that were happening in our school. And so they would write their articles and then we would use the Picasso web albums um, is what we used actually for the pictures. It, it integrated nicely with Google Sites. and so we ended up with articles that looked like this. So it was just, it kind of achieved what I had wanted all along through this wonderful Web 2.0 tool of Google. So then I just started exploring and finding all of these other things. And what actually ended up happening is that I went to a Google Apps Summit, a conference, two-day conference, and I was just blown away by all of the amazing things that were happening. You know, I had been kind of out in the cornfields of Illinois, so I didn't even really realize everything that was going on. I wasn't on any social networks in terms of Twitter or Google Plus yet, and so I didn't know all this was there. So over the next year or so, I um, was so excited to explore all of these other Web 2.0 tools. So that gives you a sense of what Web 2.0 means to me and what how I use it. Um, and now I'm going to go back into TAC and talk about one of my absolute favorite Web 2.0 tools right now, and that is TAC. Um, for those of you that are unfamiliar with TAC, TAC is just basically a very simple like website creation tool. Um, Google Sites is amazing, and it has a lot of power, but it's kind of intricate, and there's definitely a learning curve. So I was able to tackle it, and, and my colleague Maria was, because she was a sponge who just absolutely um, learned everything that I threw at her. But um, not everybody can pick up on it as quickly. And people that are easily frustrated by new things or by technology in general Definitely with like the menus and stuff like that, it's kind of hard. So what I love about TAC is that it's just so easy and it's just this fast, awesome way to be able to publish stuff to the web. So simple. You can create it in minutes. Easy to navigate. It's got just a linear style, so you just scroll through. Um, what's nice about that is that the very, one of the very first texts I created was for my parents. Um, actually, this Christmas season, they had given my son this um, advent calendar that was a, a little box of boxes. And so he got to open a little drawer or a little box each day, um, counting up to Christmas, and get to take a present out. And they had said to me, Avra, no, make sure you do this with them every day, because they know that I have great intentions when I begin projects, but sometimes um, I get sidetracked. So I said to myself, I'm going to do this every day with them, and I'm going to take a picture of him every day, and I'm going to make a tack with it. That way they can check in every day and see what he's doing, see, see how he liked it. And so I'll show you that in a minute. Um, that was the first one I did. What was nice about it was that they can just scroll through it. So it's kind of got that blog format where you can just scroll through, and it wasn't a lot of links for them to have to click on to go here and there and have to come back and all of that. So um, it also embeds other media beautifully. So you can embed a tack within a tack, or you can put a thing link within a tack, um, and you can, have, you can have links to uh, other websites and, and buttons and things like that, which I'll show you in just a sec. So I loved the ease of it, and I loved how quick it was. Um, what I decided to do was take the picture of the, they have a magical black bar um, that just quickly adds elements to your tech and just kind of break it down for you before we go in. So you can see here that you can insert all of these different things into a tech. So everything from a headline, um, which is just your brightly colored text, to just basic text. You can do images. You can do video. You can insert audio. Um, 
they even have it where you, you can sell items on TAC, you can insert maps, there's an RSVP function, so if you wanted to create a TAC for uh, your daughter's birthday party and ask people to RSVP, you can do that. So there's just a ton of options. But what's nice about it too is that the options are limited in terms of font and color and I find for myself, and definitely for students, this is a good thing because we can get very, very lost in the world of formatting very easily. Um, I know that from when I taught PowerPoint back in the day. I knew I just had to give an entire day to fonts and to custom animations because <laughs> those kids, that's the fun. That's the shiny boxes and you know the bright lights. and um, So that kind of stuff can be great and fun and motivating, but it can also detract from the content sometimes. So I'll show you what I mean. It's got limited choices, but what ends up happening then is that everything looks so professional and so beautifully put together because you don't end up with every color under the rainbow and you don't end up with 17 different fonts. <laughs> so, all right, what I'm going to try to do now is hop into um, my web browser and do that web application sharing um, so I can actually show you Tack and kind of how it works. Okay, I'm hoping that everybody can see my screen. And I guess I don't have a way of seeing that since I'm not in Blackboard Collaborate anymore. We are seeing it great, Avra. So go right ahead. Awesome. Thank you so much. I was hoping that you would say that. Okay, so this is what the TAC web page looks like when you first go, when you just type in TAC.com. And you can see that they've got a bunch of TACs already there ready to show you. Um, you can take a look. There's all sorts of all sorts of people doing all sorts of amazing things with this. So let me just show you. Um, you know what, actually, I'm going to open up a new tab and show you that one of Cameron. Um, oh, no, this wouldn't be here. Sorry. I have to go into my tax. Okay. This is somewhat spontaneous. I wasn't planning necessarily to show this, but I'm going to. Um, let me scroll down and find his gingerbread, no, Christmas. Here we go. All right. So this is the one that I made for his advent calendar. So you can kind of see um, just a little bit of what I did just on a personal level. And so you can see just all the different opportunities that you have with text. So I took a picture of him and then I would write some text. And I would take another picture and write some more text. As, you, as we scroll down past all the pictures of him, you can see here I have a YouTube video. So I took some video on my phone and then um, uploaded it to YouTube and then shared it here. So just a neat way to be able to share things that are happening in our lives with other people just quickly and easily. So that's, that's the personal version of it. And then let me show you what, um, what I think can happen in classrooms with it. I have not actually done this in a classroom just because this year I'm not working in a district with students. but. Um, I believe that it could be used for students sharing their work online and making digital portfolios and learning portfolios in general. Um, I give entire workshops on digital portfolios and I always tell people that when you think about a digital portfolio, a lot of times you're thinking about something that's like a year-long process or even a semester-long um, project. And it doesn't necessarily have to be that. You could just take one unit of study and and have kids publish and then just reflect on their learning and talk about um, what, their, what their process was and then share it out with the world. So what I've done this morning to get ready for this is I've created, um, I took one of my second graders, Jacob's dinosaur research project that he did a couple of years ago. I believe he's actually, my gosh, he's a fourth grader this year. But um, I took parts of what he did, and then I added parts of what I would envision him doing. So some of this is stuff he did, and some of this is stuff that um, I made up. But what I would do with my students when I did have them creating digital portfolios is I would have them write reflection statements on artifacts of learning, things that they did, and um, and then share, share that as just a way to kind of get that metacognition piece going and a way to be able to 
share their process and share their successes and share their joys, and then maybe even share the stuff that was frustrating to them. So if I were putting this whole thing together, um, I would start with a couple of Google documents, and I would have the students do all of their writing in a Google Doc, because that way then you can get all that editing done instead of just typing right in the TAC itself. So I just wanted to show that. But then let me just kind of show you TAC and how it works. So here you can see, this is how it starts. It starts, and they have a sense of humor, you can see. It's like, ah, feels good, start with a blank canvas. And then right here is the magical black bar. Um, here's where you add a headline, here's where you add text and a photo. What I usually do is I create a, um, a headline kind of image in Google Drawings. And so I just clicked on the camera, and then you can see here, to add my photos, I simply click again. And then what it does is it opens up an exploring window, whether you're in Windows or Mac or Chromebook, doesn't really matter. It'll just take you to where you can explore through your files and find the image that you're looking for. And then you simply click Open, and it imports it right in for you. The nice thing is you can create a link. So you can link your image to something else if you'd like. Um, and then if that's not the right one, the garbage can is right there, and you can just simply delete it. When you're happy with it, you can hit Done. So that's kind of just how I always begin. You can also begin by just simply doing a headline and typing. So I could have just done it like this. Either way, it's just completely fine. Um, just to show, too, the settings gear is going to kind of be your magic in terms of um, changing the alignment of your text or the size. They have like four basic sizes um, for your headlines. So let me just put this in the center. Um, this is the biggest one. And what it does is it kind of reverses the color scheme. It takes your um, the color and puts it behind it and makes your words white. And so what I think that it just does a nice job of separating text and pictures um, as you do different sections. But if you wanted a smaller one, you can simply do that, or it gets smaller or smaller. So some nice options there. And here, you can see the color options. Now, what I'm going to do is go over onto the right-hand side here and show you the color palettes. They have these color palettes set up. And what's so nice about them is that everything in the entire tech, except the images that you bring in, are, are just these colors. These are the colors that you have to choose from. So I had chosen, as I started this, this pistachio. And what it does is it, you can see it makes the background the large color, and then the only options for other colors in terms of your headlines and buttons are these three. So you can see now that I can have it be this lime green color or one of these brown colors. But I'm actually going to delete it all together just to move on and show you what I would put next. So that's how you choose your colors. And then here is where you choose your fonts. And I think, I've never counted, but I think they have about 20 to choose from. And that's not going to change, obviously, the font in my image here. But what it will do is that as I create headlines, it'll let me choose my font over here. They do have the option for patterns if you want to put a pattern in. Um, and that's about it in terms of being able to customize. That's not entirely true. If you go into options, you can upload a photo also. Um, but if you have your students just stick with the basics, they can, um, they can just choose some, some really, really nice coordinated colors and then a, a pattern if they want it. And it can be simple and easy for them to just really focus on their content. So what I would do next from here is I would do a text box and explain what my project is. So I'm going to come back up in terms of my tabs, and I would have the students come and choose their reflection statement. Again, having written everything in a Google Doc first, and then they can simply copy and paste from the Google Doc into the TAC. So I'm going to do Control-C, Control-V. If you're on a Mac, I think that's Command-C, Command-V. Um, so however you, want to, however you want to copy and paste. And then here again, we have the gear. So there are about four different fonts in terms of just the text fonts, and they're pretty basic. And then you can do different alignment if you'd like it to be centered versus left justified, so on and so forth. So from there then, I would have students use the headline and type in step one, um, maybe the research. And then 
I would go down and give myself another text box and I would have them head back over here. Now, what I didn't say and I should have is that this is this tack is a compilation of probably a, a month's worth of work. So all of these things, I did this with second graders, and for them to write a paragraph um, like this took us weeks. I mean, we, we spent a lot of time to write these five paragraphs that were reflection statements. And they're reflection statements of um, an essay and of a slideshow. So th again, that took weeks. So this tack, I'm just throwing together for you to show you how to use tack, but understand that this is weeks and weeks worth of work. So, um, so for example, here's the reflection statement on the note taking that Jake did. So I'm going to copy it, head back over into here, and then paste it. And then what I can do next is add a button. And what I have then is I'm going to be sharing this page, which this was there, um, and we did, this was actually what we used in second grade. Um, we would go to Enchanted Learning and have them, EnchantedLearning.com, and have them look up information and then write some sentences in here. And this was two or three or four class periods with me where they were doing the research. And so I'm, this will be the first artifact of learning that I'll share in this portfolio. So what I had the kids do then would be to take this, take their um, URL and, and paste it into this document so they have it. There's a whole lot that goes into this. Again, just remember that we have to make these things public on the web, um, and they have to know how to save it into a Google Drive and stuff like that. So those are all pieces that we could spend entire mornings talking about, but it's already 11.50, so I don't want to spend all that time. But, um, but again, they'll just copy and paste this right in here. And tech is so easy. You just put the URL here, and then call it whatever you want. And then hit apply. And so now we've got the beginnings of a neat learning portfolio. If you click here, it'll open up his notes. And right above it, we've got his reflection on what he did and what his process was. So you can go through and do the rest of that with his actual essay that he wrote, and then also his Google slideshow that he created. And if we go back here, and you know, I didn't, I just created all of this this morning, and I had told Peggy that I had to, when I turned in my slides to her, I had to make myself stop, but obviously I didn't. So I will absolutely share these links with her, and hopefully she can put them in the live binder even after the fact. So, um, because if anybody wants to just copy and paste these and create your own, go for it. Um, but what, what we basically have then is a list of the artifacts the kids are going to share, and then we have their URLs in the case of the Google Docs that they're going to share, and then we have reflection statements over here. So it just kind of is a way to keep kids organized and then be able to put this whole thing together. So at this point, I think I'm going to head back in to Blackboard and see if I can get back there. Aha, and come right back here. Okay, so um, I think I'm going to ask our moderators now how we're doing on time, because I tend to talk and talk and talk, and I don't want to go too far. If it's time for me to stop, I can, and we'll just leave the rest of the stuff in there for people to explore on their own, or if you want me to keep going, I can do that. No, don't stop. Keep going. You're doing fine. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Um, I didn't look at the time when I started, and so I knew I had about 45 minutes, so I wasn't sure if I should keep going or not. So great, thank you. Um, so I have broken down kind of the pieces of attack in the next few slides I'll show you, just to sh kind of show you what the different parts are when I create mine. So this is my magic of Google Drawings tack, um, some screen captures of it. You can see here, this is my background color, um, and I put some polka dots in it. This is an image, um, oh, that's right, you can't see my mouse anymore. <laughs> so the magic of Google Drawings piece up there is an image that I created in Google Drawings. Um, and then I've got text that I've inserted, and then down at the bottom, that blue section there with the word examples, that's a headline. And then on our next page, again, the tutorial videos, that's a headline. And then you can see I've inserted a couple of YouTube videos that I've created. 
And then here, um, another headline. You can see how the headline looks different when you don't do the great big one with all the color behind it. And um, then this is a screenshot of a Google drawing that I have. And um, let's see, go to the next one. And then there's a button. And then at the very bottom there where you see Avra's EdTech tax, that's what it looks like when you insert um, on one tack inside of another. So if you insert a, um, if you choose the insert media, you end up with this pretty little rectangle that's got a nice little thumbnail image and it just looks really nice and then people can click on it and head over to that tack or to that website. So it's just, it ends up being this beautiful way to just share information with people and it's just so quick and so easy. So. Um, here again, I just was showing some, this is what a headline looks like, this is what a photo inserted looks like, um, this is just an example of Allie's um, digital portfolio, and this was when she was in kindergarten, the first book she ever read, and so there's her reflection statement, and so on and so forth. And she just climbed out of bed, I'm sure she's thrilled to hear me sharing stuff about her. <laughs> so I'm going to go in and just talk about Google Drawings for a little bit. I feel like Google Drawings um, is kind of the... Um, the Google app that people don't talk about as much. And I have found it to be so incredibly powerful as I create my tax. I just kind of want to share a little bit about how I use it. If you haven't used Google Drawings, um, just so you know, and if you've ever used Microsoft Word or Google Docs and you've tried to insert an image in it and you've wanted to toss your computer out the window because you can't get the image to line up the way you want it to, I know I, the day that I found that wrap text fe fe feature in a, in Microsoft Word, I was thrilled because all of a sudden I could finally move my pictures around and happily put things where I wanted. But until people know how to do that, it can be very frustrating to use a word processing document and then get images in there. Just teachers that are wanting to send a note home and put an apple at the top of it or something can get super frustrated. So Google Drawings is the way to be able to do that so easily because it has all of the same editing, revising, researching tools as Google Docs. Um, but yet it's this wonderful environment where you can move images around because it's this wonderful graphical environment. You just have to create a text box for the text, but then you can still have bullets and you can still have the spell check and you can have all of those things. So here are some examples of things that I've done with kids. Um, this was actually done by a second grader at Creston School, Jack, and I do have permission from his mom to share this. Um, this was his solar system that he created. So then, um, Jack's brother, Austin, actually created this timeline, and so he was an eighth grader. So we had the second grade version, and then we have the eighth grade version. You can see the eighth grade version much more complex when he did his timeline, but you can see how it's just such a neat way to put information together. Um, what he did here, too, is that he kind of did this in two steps. He created the black part of the timeline with all of the dates first, and then he exported that as a JPEG and then brought it into a new Google drawing for all of his boxes and all of his colored lines. And I'm going to show you that in just a second. That is really part of the magic of Google drawings also, is that it will export out and you can make a ping file or you can make a JPEG file. And again, I'll show you that in just a sec. Um, this is a third grade project we did. Um, we were just looking for a way to classify um, vertebrates versus invertebrates. So we had the kids just draw a couple boxes and then insert some images. Um, here was a Venn diagram I did with the fourth grade class. Um, so you can just see just all the different possibilities. And then again, this is an image that I created using Google Drawings. So let me hop back into that application sharing and get back to my browser. And sh oh, okay, and share share a little bit of with Google Drawings. This was my Stegosaurus title that I made for that tack this morning. Let me do a new drawing. We'll just start at the very beginning because I'd just love to show you how easy it is. Um, so this is your drawing canvas. And for those of you that don't know, any time that you see this um, kind of grid-like background, that's going to tell you that it's going to be a transparent background, which is really nice because a JPEG is always going to have that white background around it, but sometimes you just want an image um, that's going to blend in nicely with your background without that white rectangle. And so you can export images out of Google Drawings as ping files .png, and that, um, that'll have that nice transparent background for you. 
once you're here, down at the bottom, you'll see that there's this little triangle, and you can put your mouse on it, and that's how you can resize your drawing canvas. So you can make it as big or as small and whatever shape you'd like it to be. That's doing it freehand. You can also go up to File, come down to Page Setup, and get very um, specific about it. I do this during the holidays. I'll come in and I'll do a 4 by 6 or a 6 by 4, I should say, inch image, and I hit OK. And then I can create something that then I can export as a JPEG and send to Walgreens or Shutterfly or Walmart, wherever you have your photos, your digital photos processed, and then end up being able to pay maybe 29 cents um, a page instead of the whole full dollar to send out a holiday card, for example. Um, so you can see the uses of that in your personal life and also, of course, in the world of schools and, and kids. Um, if you don't have a lot of color printing, capabilities at school because color ink is so expensive. This might be a neat way to be able to create a flyer for parents. You could send home a little reminder on a 4 by 6 and not have to spend a whole lot of money at a printing place or of your own. I know we all spend lots and lots of our own money as teachers with your own color ink, so on and so forth. So um, the way that you do that getting it out is to file and download as. So although I've been using the word export, um, it's truly a download in here. You can download it as a PDF, and then you've got several different formats in terms of image formats that you can download as. So um, that's, to me, that's really powerful because then that's when I take an image and I save it to my hard drive and I put it into a TAC. Um, or I put one Google drawing image into another Google drawing. Um, also, Google drawing works really well with Google Docs. It's um, something if I hop back over here into, into this Google Doc, you'll see I can go to insert and I can choose drawing and a little mini Google drawing interface appears, window appears, allows me to do some drawing and put something in. And let me draw, oh, I was doing the wrong one. So even if I were just drawing a rectangle, it's not happy with what I'm doing here. Ah, there we go. I just needed to be a little bit slower and more deliberate. I think my caffeine is kicking in. So you can draw something in Google Drawings and then bring it right into Google Docs if you'd like. A lot of possibilities here. Um, all different options in terms of drawing tools. You've got some shapes. You can see callouts, even some equation um, images. And then this would be how you would draw a text box, and you could do all your typing right within it. And here, you can insert your images. What's neat about any of the Google products is that whenever you do an image search within them, the, all the results are going to be labeled for commercial reuse with modifications. So you know that they're ones that are OK for students to use um, without needing to worry about the copyright issues and things like that. So a lot of options um, with Google Drawings also. Let me hop back in here to Blackboard. Um, just finish up. Sorry about that. It's taken me a minute here to get past everything I'm doing. I'm not sure, sorry about this, I'm not sure why I can't get back to where I was. You can just close that tab um, for Blackboard Collaborate in your browser because you don't need that again. It okay. won't take you out of the room. And then um, if you want to continue with application sharing, just select the tab oh. you want to share. Okay, here it is. I wonder why I couldn't see it before. Okay, so. Be sure to keep your browser on top. OK. Huh. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. OK, now we're seeing uh, Cameron. 
Yeah, I know. I'm I'm back in my browser and I'm just having trouble getting back into my slides. Um, oh, I can do that for you. Can you? That's what. There I'm you doing. go. See, and I still don't see it. I wonder why. Oh, okay. This now I'm back. It's it's okay. got to be that I've got two monitor I've got two monitors going. I just have <laughs> I have way too much technology going. Sorry about that. Um, there you go. Okay, great. Well. Anyway, again, I'm not sure where I'm at with time, but um, a couple other things with Google Drawings is that there are some awesome templates that Google has. And so, for example, here you can see someone's created a wonderful newsletter template. Um, the link is there. I think I also put it in the live binder. And so what you do with a, a Google template is just open it up and then make your own copy, file and make a copy. Um, and here someone created one in terms of reading strategies and things like that. So there's just a lot of possibilities with Google Drawings. And I know if anyone's out there using Google Classroom, um, you know, you can push out assignments to kids that way. And it, they just integrate beautifully. So um, this was a, an image that I created just recently when I was creating a thing link. Again, another learning por portfolio. I actually had my students do this last year um, instead of creating a tag. We used Google Drawings to create an image and then they just put individual images in it to um, eventually in ThingLink then link to the different elements of their project. So you can see we took that Google Drawing, we downloaded it as a JPEG and then we uploaded it into ThingLink and um, it was a neat way for them then to link out again to the different elements of their project and just share their essay and share their notes and share their presentation. And in that case, they had done um, also a pick monkey collage of images. And they did a move note, um, which is a, a video recording of themselves talking about um, all of the different elements of their project and, and their reflections on it. And then they just had a video, too, that they needed to include for that assignment. So um, that was another way that I used Google Drawings. So again, I'm going to check in with our moderators. I could talk about MoveNote, but I know it's 5 after 12 already, so give me some guidance. Keep going. OK. <laughs> um, so MoveNote is kind of was my go-to way last year for having kids reflect on their learning um, neat way for them to be able to get those speaking and listening skills and strategies um, and standards met that we want as educators, but um, it was with a fun app, so it made it more fun for kids. Um, what MoveNote is, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, it's this wonderful way to um, have them record themselves on one side of the screen and then bring up any Google document, um, anything from their Google Drive or anything from their hard drive on the other side. So let's see. Did I put, no, I didn't put a picture. OK, then I'll, I'll hop back into that application sharing in just a second and show you one. Um, but I won't play the video. I know that, that won't work as well. But what it does is on one side of the screen, you see your file. So whether it's an image file, like a photo, or whether it's a Google document or a Google slideshow, anything that they have on the, one, on the other side, on that side, I'm sorry. And then on the other side is the, is the webcam and the student being able to talk. So let me hop back over here and show you one. Um, I'm going to hop into my um, tack that's kind of my directory of all of my educational technology tacks here and head down to read, write, and speak all about it. This is where I'm pretty sure I have a, I have Allie's um, move note here at the bottom. Scroll down and show it to you. Here we go. You can see in this tack, this um, are a bunch of, those were media that I had inserted. So you can kind of see what that looks like. So here we have on the right hand side, we have Allie's Google Doc with the word evidence in it. And what she had to do for this assignment was just um, 
explain the word evidence and then write it and use it in a sentence. And then over on the left hand side you see her video. Um, she is not actually pictured in this. The funny thing about this is that when the 7th and 8th grade ELA teacher initially showed the 7th and 8th graders move note, they really didn't have any interest in being pictured on screen. Um, they kind of were like, oh no, we're above that. We're, we have no interest in being there for school purposes, even though they are sharing you know, videos of themselves in Snapchat and Instagram constantly, when it was an educational purpose, they were like, no way. So what she did, knowing the age and understanding where they're coming from, she said, okay, if you don't want to be pictured, that's fine, but you need to put something in front of the camera that's then going to go with what you're saying, and then we need to be able to hear your voice. So again, I won't play this, but what Allie does is she explains the word evidence, she says what it is, she defines it, she explains why she used this photo here in her Google Doc, she used is it in a sentence and then she goes on to say that this is a pencil from a crime scene and she, it's really funny she says actually no it's not it's just a pencil with red sharpie on it but um, you can see that that's just one way of using move note another way that I've used move note with kids um, was for school announcements we had them start doing um, school announcements and they would announce kids birthdays they would announce what was for lunch so there you can see um, her face and she just basically reads what's on the Google document and the neat thing about move note is that if you have a Google document that's several pages long or if you have a Google document that is um, a slideshow it you can flip through the, the different pages you can flip through the different slides while you're talking and it just it just works beautifully so um, neat way for them to use that and then what would happen is that the teachers would all just show that in their classrooms each day instead of listening to um, announcements over the PA. So I also with MoveNote have had, um, we had third graders write poems and um, they wrote them on paper first and then they put them in on um, a Google Doc so that they were typing them in and, and doing their editing and stuff that way and then they showed their Google Doc on the one side and then read it on the other. So um, neat ways of using it. I have been teaching it in workshops lately and I've had foreign language teachers say, oh my gosh, I'm going to use this to have them conjugating their verbs. It's an awesome way. I also had um, a teacher that was working with students who had, um, they had they were students who were deaf and they were going to do um, sign language with because of the video piece to it. So a um, lot of different uses for MoveNote and um, and definitely, definitely a tool that I think is really important. I love when kids can put all of their artifacts in, um, let me show you the one I created last night, they can put all of their artifacts into a MoveNote and um, I have to remember the name of it. It's probably something with digital portfolios, um, and then talk about their talk about each element and talk about the things that they've done. Let me head back over to my text. I can't remember the name of this one. This is what happens when I do things on the fly. I'm a little bit um, disorganized then. That's why I try and try to prepare and prepare and prepare because otherwise I get sidetracked. Nope, that's the wrong one. That's the one I did this morning. Sorry, here this one. So this was our thing link and then at the end, after all of the different Google Docs that the students created, um, in order to reflect on it, I had them create a move note where they were able to insert all of the different um, pieces and elements to their learning and then reflect on them verbally and talk about what worked for them, what didn't work for them, the processes that they did along the way, um, just the different elements and what they liked about it, what they didn't like about it, what they learned, and so on and so forth. So I think we can kind of get into some deep, deeper conversations about what kids are successful at, why they're successful at it, um, and what makes learning fun for them, what makes it hard for them, and that way maybe then we can take the stuff that's difficult for them and, and make it easier. So a um, lot of reasons to use digital portfolios, a lot of reasons to share online, and MoveNote's another one of those awesome apps that just kind of goes right in. So, okay, let's see if I can get back <laughs> to my slides again. Ah, there. Beautiful. I don't know if I did that or if Peggy did that, but either way, it magically happened. So, bottom line, Web 2.0 tools, I believe, are magical. I think that they are 
a way that kids all of a sudden can take control of their learning, they can take control of their sharing, they can practice sharing things in an appropriate way, um, and in a way that makes them feel proud and joyful, successful. Um, I've seen kids become way more engaged with these tools um, than they ever were just sitting in the classroom. So I think that we're at a place right now in education where we have so many neat things that can happen. And with, when we start to use, utilize these tools with kids and, you know, get beyond just the ideas that we have in our heads, start asking them how they want to use the tools, then that's when the real magic is going to take place. So I apologize for getting a little disorganized at the end. I was thinking of things last minute that I wanted to share with you. A um, little embarrassed that this has been recorded, <laughs> that part of it, because it wasn't as polished. But I appreciate you sticking with me. And this was so Thanks much a lot, fun. Avra. Thank you so much I for having me. I will ask you some questions that I captured during the time. Well, the first question had to do with the bandwidth in your school, but after you started talking, it seemed like it was an isolated group of computers. We um, we had we had a T1 line when I first started back mm -hmm. in 2000, and um, it was fine for us until we hit about. Well, about 2012, all of a sudden I started using all of these tools and it sucked all the bandwidth and my superintendent wow. went through the roof. He was <laughs> so frustrated. So then we had to, we had to move over to doing cable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is there a real educational dashboard on TAC that is someplace to upload, say, uh, a database of students and control their work? You know, I forgot, I'm glad that that question was asked and I forgot to mention. TAC, it sounds like to me that TAC is working on becoming, I think when they first started making it, and I, I'm not at all speaking for the company or anything, mm -hmm. but when they first started making it, I don't know that they necessarily knew that there were going to be as many educational purposes. And so now oh. they have a whole section that's called TAC EDU. And mm -hmm. I've actually just recently become a TAC EDU advocate. Just in the mm -hmm. last week they asked me to do that. But um, So I'm learning more and more about it. There are there are tech boards that have all of these different uses where teachers and educators across the country are using it, mm -hmm. and it's awesome. The other thing I forgot to mention about tech is that it does have a public and a private um, option. And mm -hmm. I didn't show how to publish it either, and I should have, but it, you, can make it, you can make it private and you can password protect it. So you can still share the URL like with parents, but mm -hmm. if teachers do want to keep things private, it can, it can be password protected so that only the people with the password can see it, which is really mm -hmm. nice. Yeah. And is it also along the lines of other sites similar that is for over 13? You know, well, I was looking. I was looking for the. I was looking for the terms of service last night and didn't mm -hmm. didn't find them. So I'll mm -hmm. have to ask them that and find out for you. Okay. Um, I'm not sure to be honest okay. with you. Okay. Um, for digital. Okay, course. it does stay. I'm reading. I'm sorry. Reading in the comments there. It does. It does state over thirteen. Okay, it Patty does. Just mentioned okay. It does over Good. thirteen. Um, I think you showed this. You can embed documents as well as videos and other media in the TAC, right? Yeah, you can. And I, I, have, I have done that, where I put mm -hmm. an actual document in. And the Google Sheets and Google Docs, the actual document goes in there. It's got scrolling features on the side. Mm -hmm. And you can do that. It's just a very small, small, it's small. So then you really okay, have to small scroll. Window. Yeah. Which, yeah, which is why I tend to put buttons in instead, sure. just because I don't, but that's the same thing with Google Sites. You know, I mean, if you've got a small right. image of it, then it's small. But you can actually put them right in there, mm -hmm. which is kind of neat. Good. Um, are there any restrictions on embed codes? Um, you know, Google Sites takes out some types of code, like JavaScript or such. You know, what's neat about TAC is that, and this is where it makes it so user friendly for people who are just getting started, they mm -hmm. don't have you use the embed code. They just ah. have you do the URL. Okay. So you can just paste any URL in. Mm -hmm. and, um, and there's a lot of different, there's like 250 different things that they show that you can put in there. I mean, it's oh, just, wow. It's really cool. Yeah. And so it's not, um, it's really not very limited. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, does it work with Google SketchUp, that is Google Drawings? 
good qu good question. I don't know. I haven't okay. tried. <laughs> okay. Because I know you can export SketchUp documents, and certainly you can export drawings, but I don't know if you can import one into the other. That's a really good question. You know, and I don't know why I'm not hopping over. I have two monitors. I should be trying it while you ask me questions. <laughs> so I can maybe answer more. <laughs> well, those are the questions I captured. So um, there weren't many today. Okay. Well, good. I mean, not good. I, I would love questions. Right. But, right. Um, I was just going to see if I could throw a, a drawing in there, but um, I'm not, I have not tried it before. So. Okay. Peggy, did you want to take over the upcoming shows? I sure do, and I'll do this real fast because I know we're running way over time, but this has been so great. Thank you so much, Avra, for sharing with us today. Um, we have another great show coming up next weekend, March 21st. We're going to be hearing about a fantastic new tool program called Eyewitness, which is interviews with Holocaust survivors and witnesses. And we have the Director of Education presenting for us that day. Um, our March 28th date isn't decided yet, but uh, we're, we're working on something special. No show on April 4th because that's Easter weekend in the United States. April 11th, we have a great Discovery Education Network show on all of their free virtual field trips and free resources that you can find on the site with Kyle Shutt. Shoot, I wish I knew how to say his name. I need to ask him. And then we have a great show on April 18th with the guru of ThingLink, Susan Oxnavad, is going to be with us, and we are very excited about that. No show on April 25th because of the Den Spring Virtual Conference. We all love to go to that. And then on May 2nd, we have another great featured teacher coming back, and that is Lisa Parisi. So we hope that you'll join us every Saturday that you can. Thanks, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest venture. He's gathered together all of his uh, professional development resources in one place, including the Host Your Own Webinar series where you can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate classroom and be the moderator, be the host in the room for free as long as you make your session public. You can do that. You can nominate a featured teacher like Avra was today by filling out the form at this link, uh, tinyurl.com, CR2O Live Feature Teacher Nominate without the E at the end. This is also in the Live Binder Resources section for Classroom 2.0 Live. But you nominate yourself as well. As you exit the session, your browser should open the Classroom 2.0 Live survey. You can also get the link directly at tinyurl.com slash CR2O Live Survey, or you can take the link from the chat box that Peggy just posted, or again, it's in the resource tab in the Live Binder. When you complete the survey, you can request a professional development certificate. And in the past few months, your name actually gets printed on a certificate. When you do make that request, though, make sure you use a personal email account rather than a school email address, because schools tend to block this email from getting to you. You can also uh, follow the, the link that's, that will be in chat, I think, to get to the survey as well. The video collection and audio collection for recordings are also on iTunes U, so you can subscribe there as well. Or you can su subscribe to the RSS feed on the Classroom 2.0 Live site. And of course, you can also go to the recordings page and get the, the full Illuminate recording there as well. 
Again, very special thanks to Avra Robinson for being our featured teacher for March, to Steve Hargadon, founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Weebly.com for providing our site, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who partic participated in today's show. Thank you so much.